Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end-of-life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture so we shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It's time to share the way we want to live at the end of our lives. And it's time to communicate about the kind of care we want and don't want for ourselves. We believe that the place for this to begin is not in the intensive care unit. Together, we can explore the various paths to life's ending. Together, we make these difficult conversations easier. Together, we make sure that our own wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. So if you're ready, we ask, navigate the journey. For those of you that have been with us, you know we have invited members of various religions and traditions to talk about the end-of-life customs in their culture. Today's guest is a friend who I've been looking forward to having on the show since we began the series. In fact, many, many people have asked, when are you going to have a Hawaiian as a guest? Therefore, today we have Ramsey Tom. And he is, everybody knows Ramsey. He's an <laughs> inspiring speaker, teacher, writer, and does Tai Chi on the beach in Waimanalo. Yeah, it's actually Hawaiian Lua. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he is just, he is a wonderful, wonderful person and steeped in the Hawaiian culture. And so what better to talk about the Hawaiian culture than Ramsey? So, well, hello, Joan. Uh, welcome, Marcia, thank you so much. Welcome, thank you. welcome. Well, aloha. Aloha. Thank you for having me. Now, I watched you any number of times. <clears throat> Tell us about aloha. You know, that's, it's, it's so big. It's kind of like asking somebody about God. As, well, as, well, as, as big as you say, it's, yes. it's always bigger, mm -hmm. right? So aloha is like that. But fundamentally, aloha is really... Uh, a condition of being. It's a spirit. And it is about being connected, being a part of the whole. And the whole what? The whole spirit, the entity. Uh, we say it's a reciprocity agreement of giving and receiving. It's acknowledging that your breath is my breath. We share that breath. And we do so in union. And so anytime you say aloha, it's not just a greeting of hello or goodbye, but it's a commitment. It's a commitment to say that in the time that we're spending together, your air is my air. My space is your space. And we honor that space. And we care for that. And we care for that breath through time. You know, that ha, that life-giving breath yeah. that joins us to one another and to all things. This is aloha. It's, it's more than just the names of a building or unfortunately which we've done to that very spiritual concept. Yes. And but it's a way of being. It is a way of being. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you do a word search, mm -hmm. Aloha has more hits than any <clears throat> other word. Oh yeah. People really like Aloha, right. we, whether they yeah. know it, what right. it is or not. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. really like it. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you've heard me talk about it before, but we know that in our Mo'olelo, our, our Olelo, Mo'olelo the story, but yeah. Olelo the, the language, um, it's steeped in energy, spiritual energy, and that spiritual energy, uh, people pick up on it, especially when you say it properly. And so it's very difficult because it has to come out of your mouth, and it's being vocalized on that ha, that breath. The ha. Mm -hmm. So if you thought about it and you want to express it, you've thought about it, you felt it, and now you're expressing it. As Auntie Palahi would say, anything that comes from your lips between your teeth on the life-giving breath of Ha has been manifested. It will be out there. So be careful of what you think, <laughs> feel, and yes, say. I, yeah. right? So as you would say, the seeds of thought are watered by the emotion of, the, of heart and your expressions that utterance that comes from your mouth is giving that, that life. So I think that when people really connect to aloha, those that are in tune, they feel that. 
you know, they may not understand it, but they feel it. I, do you ever really understand most of what we feel, what we take in, we don't understand? We, no, we I, spend the day with nature and we know it feels good, but we don't really understand. Yeah, you know, there's, there's that whole thing of knowledge and understanding, but in the absence of wisdom, how do you practice it? How do you share with others? Well, but you're so a I'm, kapuna, and that's what kapunas are supposed to do, is share wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, like most things, I think, as you do, as we live, they say from the day we're born, we're aging. You know, mm -hmm. so as we age, and as we live and we express, I think uh, we learn more about it. In fact, I was asked recently, can you teach aloha? And I, I was kind of mindful about the response. I think you can learn it. Definitely you can learn it. But we learn it by doing. I was going to say, yeah, it's not, that? It's not a cognitive thing, which we tend to want to do by creating boxes. Shake their hands, say hi, smile, all of the mechanical things. But you could repeat those mechanical things in different settings and not have the same experience. Because in many ways, aloha is actually drawing upon the experiences within that are triggered by the things around us and the relationships. Mm -hmm. So someone else could be sitting here and we won't have that same feeling regardless of the words I use or the behaviors or actions that I demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Because the chemistry, the, that spirit wasn't there. Now, I want to get to the end of life. Mm -hmm. However, before mm -hmm. we get there, <laughs> you did a a piece at Unity Church about diversity. Yes. I thought that was marvelous. Can you do it in 25 words or less? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'll try. I'll, I'll no, I'm not try just kidding. <laughs> okay. But you did your explanation of diversity because, and it, it goes to the spirit of our program that we have asked all of these mm -hmm. different traditions mm -hmm. and cultures to share with us. And it, it is, quote, diverse mm -hmm. in the ground we cover. But your definition of diversity was magnificent. So well, I appreciate that. Can we? Uh, and again, I think that's a reflection of aloha and of who we are as Hawaii. Um, my reflection was that most times I hear things about diversity, uh, there's hakaka, problems. And they're using diversity, they being whoever the company or organization might be, as a way of, um, it's, it's like an excuse. But really, the, the, the tension is unity. They're looking to find a way to coalesce, to bring people together. So rather than looking at the problem as is expressed through diversity, I chose to look at the preferred condition, which is lokahi the unification and working together as a whole. And Lokahi really isn't so much about unity as much as it is solidarity. Working together, though we may have differences, and honoring those differences as much as we honor the similarities. And in this case, I use the reef as an example. So the presentation was really based on lessons from the reef, lessons in diversity. Uh, and it acknowledges that if you look at a healthy reef, that reef system includes multiple colors of fishes, sizes, you know, corals and all those kinds of things, which are not being managed by any one particular person or entity, but instead respect exists on the reef. And every fish, every coral, every seaweed, every large mammal that lives in and around that reef is acknowledging it, and it is the diversity of that reef that gives it its health. And really, if you think about it, with we as the human community, if we look at ourselves as a reef, we aren't really operating in the same way. No. In many ways, but one, because we believe all people should be sharks, or all people are minnows, or what have it is. We've categorized ourselves rather than acknowledging the relationships that we have to one another, um, all the colors of the reef. Mm -hmm. And so that's essentially what it was all about, is beginning to look at that and recognizing it comes down to respect at the end of the day. And knowing that we all have something to contribute to the whole. And we have to invite that. Mm -hmm. And so there's some humility in involved as, as well. You know, uh, 
Pono Shim. Mm -hmm. When I was working the city council, this is many years ago, he was testifying, and I'm just sitting there listening. I don't remember who he was talking to or anything else about that day. Mm -hmm. But he said to this international group that here in Hawaii, we are not diverse, we are married. And I thought, damn, that is the That's best true. description I have heard. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, if you think about other cosmopolitan centers, you may have multiple groups there, but there's Chinatown, Japantown, Koreatown. You have, there seems to be a very strong delineation between them and us. And mind you, we do have multiple groups here. That's what makes Hawaii. But we do marry one another. We do. My uh, son-in-law is Chinese. <laughs> yeah. So as a result of that, we have this blend. Mm -hmm. And maybe the word tolerance isn't enough, but there's, we develop a tolerance. And we recognize that the person in the elevator standing behind you could easily be a cousin. Yes. Right? So yes. you're mindful about the words you choose and the things yes. you say. Yes. So, because it's very true. We do marry one another. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you get this blend. And as I, as I suggested in that presentation, it's not a melting pot like other people think, but we're more like beef stew. Ooh. Right? And everyone still maintains their identities. But when we work together and create this blend, the, the hanai and the hapa, this mm -hmm. blending, we create a gravy. You know? And that gravy is the flavor of culture. And I believe Hawaii has a gravy. And the longer it cooks, the better it tastes. Oh, yeah. But again, it requires steam. It requires yeah. heat. Yeah. So as they always say, if you don't like being in the kitchen or the heat, <laughs> stay out of the kitchen. Same thing. Part of the beef stew is that you need sometimes that pressure so that we can bring out the best in one another. So now let's talk about the culture, the Hawaiian culture, mm -hmm. and dealing with the end of life. And I'm not talking about accidents and just old age. Mm -hmm. But let's assume you have a brain tumor or a cancer or something, mm -hmm. and you, you know the person is not going to get well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that kind of thing in terms of what, how the person, person is treated? Mm -hmm. uh, I assume they're at home. Mm -hmm. We're not... We, I don't like the idea of hospitals and all that mm -hmm. stuff, all those sure. wires that bothers me. Mm -hmm. But this is Tutu, and she has an ailment, mm -hmm. and she you know she's not going to make it. Right. How do you deal with that and in the Hawaiian culture? Well, I, I can't begin to tell you how timely this conversation is because we're actually experiencing that in our family as we speak. So I would have to say, first of all, it has a lot to do with faith. Um, and I'm saying that as a Hawaiian of modernity because as Hawaiians, as people of this place, we have and choose multiple religions, if you right. would, to express mm -hmm. our faith and to connect with that which we believe to be greater than ourselves. So depending on which family or which dogma, if you would, or religion that they should follow, um, I believe that leads and guides them in their faith. And so I was born and raised in a faith that believes in something greater than ourselves, a place that's greater than we are, and that there is that place. However, we go back to Hawaiian culture prior to the introduction of Christianity, and that's debatable now, whether it was in 1820 or perhaps earlier, right, as, was, as early as the 1520. Okay. Yeah. Now, while we're debating, mm -hmm. let's go to a good break. Okay, And that's then great. we come back and let's talk about the debate on when all of this began. Sure, sure. Be glad to do it. Thank you. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii where I talk to other shrinks 
Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Hi, and we're back with my dear friend, Kumu Ramsey Tom. Thank you. Who is an absolute delight. And you were, I guess we were talking about the end of life, and you were telling us about it in an experience you're having at this moment. Yeah, with, with our own family. Um, and over the last several years, because of uh, a large Hawaiian family, my father had multiple siblings. And so time is catching up. You know, and I think part of the question has to do with what are your beliefs? What are your faith? What is your faith? And we believe that there is something beyond this, that we are here and learning and sharing with one another, but there is some place beyond that. And from the Hawaiian cultural standpoint versus the Christian practices or other practices of other religions that we as Hawaiians have participated in since the overthrow or mm -hmm. since the introduction of Western concepts and, or global concepts to Hawaii, um, we did have our own practices. But as I was mentioning before the break, you know, there are some suggestions that Christianity, either from Spain or Portugal, had made its way here as early as the 1520, 1526. Um, but missionaries then, Protestant missionaries, arrived here in 1820. Mm -hmm. So since then, you know, many of the practices that we understood, understood or practiced then were either had gone underground, disappeared, or were put away. So it's very difficult for those to go back and say, this is what we actually believe, because so much of it, the, the purity of it, has been woven into a new lay of spirituality. And so it's, I can see why people would have difficulty saying, this is what we did as Hawaiians. But the kupuna, the elders that taught me and mentored me, um, were very clear in their perspectives, is that the veil that we call the physical life is just that, a veil. And that the uhane, the spirit, transfers from that to another place. And so our kupuna are always with us. It's just recognizing that they're on the other side of the veil. Now there are questions of how many times to that. So other traditions of multiple life experiences. But that hasn't been the conversation that we've had within the cultural um, context that we're talking about. But the idea that kupuna are there, uh, we use terms like aumaku, that family re relative or guide. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we say someone will pass and eventually become aumaku, that person, that entity, that spiritual guidance that directs us. So if you really believe in something like that and you want to be of a service to your community, family, ohana, the aina, then the question is, how can you be a good aumukua? Or how can you be a good kupuna? Which is planning ahead, knowing that you will be there for someone else. But it's very difficult, as you said, most people don't want to have that conversation, that there's a finality of it. And that often instills fear in people. And nobody wants to talk about that. Right. Right. Uh, and that's why we want to talk about it because right. it, it's, it's a sacred moment. That's it's, right. it, it, that's right. it shouldn't be scary. That's right. I, I really believe there's two gifts that, if ever offered, are ultimate gifts to be at the moment of one's birth and at the moment of one's transition. And I've been fortunate to have experienced both. And they're, they're both magical events. Um, because you get to see the continuum of life. Mm -hmm. Again, I believe and have that faith that there is a continuum, that we don't, just don't become you know, dust in the ground, yes. that, that physically. Mm -hmm. But the spiritual, spiritual mind, the entity. And so I, I have experienced it and see it, and my sense is that our kupuna are with us, and we just have to ask. So, okay, <clears throat> is there, in getting ready for mm. the transition, mm -hmm. the days or whatever, what do you give them medications? Do you uh, help help them in any way? What what is or is there a ceremony? Is there a process? Is there rituals that 
you do prior to? Well, well like I said, I, again, depending on what practices people are okay, subscribing let's, to let's, today. Let's but my kupuna, forget the, forget the, I remember the my but, yeah, I remember my grandmother um, talking about her grandfather prior to his transition. And that while he was laying there, he was having these conversations with unseen entities. Full on, like we're talking yeah. here. And she asked her grandmother at the time, what is Tutuman doing? And he was essentially telling them to leave him alone. He's not ready yet to go, go away. Go away. <laughs> I'll be with you shortly. But you know, for the time being, uh, hell it, you know, go away someplace. Um, so at that level of clarity, I think, to acknowledge that, then I think that's when the veil begins to break down and, and you may be in self-reparation. For families, however, again, um, there are different ceremonies. There are different concepts. In Ho'oponopono, for instance, that is the one practice that I believe that we've held on to or maintained um, that is critical, I think, at those times. And of course, most people understand Ho'oponopono as forgiveness. Uh, a forgiveness process or a mediation process, but a whole point of point is about making right. So if a person is of clear mind, knowing that they are about to transition, I have received calls from individuals like this saying, I would like to hope on a point because I would like to clear my heart and my mind as I prepare to transition, as well as to ask forgiveness from others and to extend forgiveness to those perhaps that I have not. Um, so I, I, th I think for me and at least the kupuna that have mentored me, that is one of the very more important practices that has carried forward with us. Um, because we die daily. Yes. When we do the physical death, that's another thing. But I think we die daily when we harm others. Others do harm to us. And our spirit dies to a certain degree. And it is that practice of Ho'oponopono that kind of gives us back our life. Now, this is very different from the commercial stuff that's yeah, going on, right? So we're yeah. going to that deeper spiritual recognition that um, I, I need to let go. I need to release and the mihi, to let that go, to oki, to cut, and to pani, to close. These are the, the concepts, and I believe that is one of the important practices. There's also acknowledgement that the spirit will leave and you know, find its way to the door. Uh, we call that the, the lena. There are different places here on each island, actually, where the spirit, the oh, uka'ane, will the, walk. Oh, the point of... Ka'ena point ka is point. one of them. Yeah. yeah, there's another one in Ka'ava. Uh, there's several places where the uhane would go into lele to jump into the next next world. Yeah. Oh, this is so wonderful. My goodness. Do you... What about medications? As you enter, do they have any Hawaiian medications? Or I know I had cancer, and mm. my friend gave me that noni, which was some awful stuff, but mm -hmm. it did work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, I was fortunate to be mentored by some of the lao lapao from Hawaii Island, Kohala in particular, and Honoka. And interesting enough, the contemporary ailments and illnesses we did not have. Right. So they did not have, you know, uh, responses for it. And in this case, this kupuna actually learned in a dream from his own daughter who suffered uh, an illness and passed in transition. And she came back to him in the dream and said, Papa, here's the answer. And gave him the formula of lao to heal cancer. And so it's a ser series of plants that were put together by him and put into a concoction he, he shared that with. And it has actually um, healed people of cancer, preventing their death. Mm -hmm. um, in most cases, it always worked. But again, it always comes to the individual, your degree of faith, your practice, you know, your own discipline. And as uh, Uncle Tommy would say, it's really up to the guy upstairs if this works or not. Right? So there are, there are different herbs depending on the dis-ease or the ailment that can ease and perhaps you know, provide comfort uh, to that process, if not actually provide for healing. Right? So yeah. there's a difference between healing and, and comfort. So. so, well, if we're just going to make the person comfortable mm -hmm. so that the passing mm -hmm. is not in pain and not mm -hmm. all of that stuff, mm -hmm. how about that? How do you? Well, you know, I, I, 
I think the one that most people use now, well, they're doing it for entertainment, but it's also for ceremony. But ava root has a way of reducing the anxiety. In fact, it was used uh, before decisions such as war. Right. It was important that the chiefs sat and did ava uh, because it does bring that down. And it's not a hallucinogen, but it does calm and bring you know, some kind of malie, makes it a little smoother and, and calm. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's one of the ones that would be, a, I think, a prescription, if you would. Um, but that's the one I, I would probably uh, turn um, to. I, I just thinking about how to make it as calming and as mm -hmm. peaceful as not to think that this is going to cure you because we passed that stage, right. mm -hmm. but to make these last moments peaceful and mm -hmm. wonderful rather than in turmoil and pain mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. morphine and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was, where I'm going with that one. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know that we had those kinds of, I guess, remedies that equal the pharmaceutical things that we have now, which obviously have so many side effects. Yeah. But these natural principles, again, coupled with ceremony, mm -hmm. because it's so much about how the spirit is responding. Now, to the point you made earlier in terms of whether you are of mind, presence, right. that has a lot to do with it. And so someone who is not physically present or mentally present may experience different, different things no, depending but, on what you I, give them. But I think for the most part, um, I, I'm thinking of people that are, that know this, that what mm -hmm. they have, mm -hmm. they've already done all the surgery, mm -hmm. have done all the stuff, and this is it. Mm -hmm. This is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to spend money and ten thousand dollars a day in mm -hmm. the hospital. Mm -hmm. That we are at home. We want to be with our family. We want our loved ones with us. Mm -hmm. How do? What is that process? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't know. I can't be definitive because it's been so long and very few people are practicing those concepts. In fact, we we subscribe more to the contemporary practices today. I think the planning, however, is knowing that one as kupuna, as spirit, uh, if you subscribe to that at all, you want to leave this place better than you found well, it. Yes. Right? And hopefully you'll be of mind and spirit to guide those who call upon you. Right, so really it's about preparing in that way. As far as the physical transition, um, again, it'll vary from different you know, ailments or different people and different traditions. On one island, it might be one plant. On another island, it's another. Th th I think this is the part that I, our kupuna were very clear about, at least the ones that I, I learned from, is that if you are from a particular place and you leave that place, your dis-ease oftentimes is a reflection of your disconnection. Ah. Because you are no longer your DNA, because you're no longer okay. eating Eat of the food, food of that place. Therefore, you're, an, you're disconnected from your ancestors, from your DNA, etc. Because, hey, Hawaii, I am that place. So oftentimes, what is going to heal you is best if you're from Ka'u to eat of Ka'u. Ka ah, that, that is wonderful. If you live in Kapa'ulu, yep. then eat from Kapa'ulu. But I think that's only... Fast food. I think it's Burger King. <laughs> yeah, it's fast food. Popeyes. Yeah. Well, listen, um, sweetheart, yeah. they are telling me that we have run out of time. So, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I am too. We're just getting started. Yeah. You will come back. I'll, I'll be glad to come back if I'm invited. Thank oh, you. Well, consider this an invitation. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Thank this you. This has been a real pleasure. And... So when it comes time, I'm going to call you <laughs> <laughs> when it comes time for me to pass, because this is that's the way I want to go. Right, Thank you so much. Oops. Oh, well, I guess oh, well. that's time. I guess it's time. I guess that's somebody telling me to get off there. That's it.